it's always good to come home. And I do want to say on behalf of all the names that he named off, all you parents uh, that endured me as a youth pastor, God bless you. Thank you so much for your patience. And I do apologize if there was any injury uh, put on to your kids or any damage done to your property. Uh, if there is or was, just get hold of Brother Andrew. who will help out uh, with all of the cost of all that. But uh, I want to begin by saying thank you again for allowing me uh, to come home uh, because uh, this is home. As Brother Andrew just alluded to, me and my family uh, were members here uh, for approximately a little over four years and my family and I owe a great deal of gratitude uh, towards Dr. Wolfenbarger and the Joshua Baptist Church. It was, as a matter of fact, this church uh, did so much for us um, and uh, again to put that into the time allotted uh, that Brother Andrew gave me, I'm not going to be able to squeeze it into, uh, but uh, I do want to, again, just say thank you uh, for allowing me to be here and uh, for allowing me to be a part of this wonderful conference. As a matter of fact, whenever Brother Andrew told me what this conference was all about and, and again, was uh, kind of giving me the direction that y'all were going and uh, how, again, y'all were going to focus on God's Word and to take that direction and to uh, kind of put it into a, a format that... Uh, prayerfully God would lead me to in scripture to uh, kind of put together a message that would not just encourage you uh, to look towards God's word, trust in God's word, but at the same time kind of tell a story of how God uh, used this church uh, and the people in it to impress upon my life and uh, encourage me in the ministry. And I, I started praying about that and God led me to a passage of scripture and I'm going to ask you if you would tonight just quickly to turn to the New Testament book of Mark, Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. And while you're turning there, I called my wife on the way over here and she again told me to tell everyone hi. Um, but uh, I said, yeah, Brother Andrew pulled a fast one on me. As a matter of fact, he, he put me in front of Dr. House. And uh, she said, well, it's better than being behind him. Amen. Uh, but thank you to the usher that gave me Dr. House's notes because I'm going to use those tonight. So uh, he'll just echo what I'm about to say here in just a moment. Uh, I'm joking. Hey, man, I, well, I might be. might not be. You just never know. But I'll admit I came in here a little nervous tonight because, again, Andrew told me that Dr. House is going to be preaching right after me. But then I really got nervous whenever I was visiting with Brother House just a moment ago. And, again, I love Dr. House as I know that you do. I mean, I admire him as being a great man of God, and as we were talking, I thought he was going to say something, you know, uh, very, you know, stoic, you know, something stoic and spiritual. I thought he was going to say, Brother Chris, I'm going to be praying for you. Or I even thought, you know, hopefully he'd say, or I'm looking forward to hearing what God's laid on your heart, but he didn't say anything like that at all. As a matter of fact, he said, listen, son, no longhorn sermons. I'd never heard the terminology before. I said, what do you mean longhorn sermons? sermons? He said, you know, the ones with two points and a lot of bull in between. No longhorn sermons. <laughs> Get to the point. He said, you only got 25 minutes and I don't want to have to clean up after you. So, Brother House, I'm going to do my best. But again, seriously, it's an honor to be here with you tonight and kind of give you an update. The cliff notes, if you will, because I am limited in time and I don't want to keep Dr. House uh, waiting, but... Uh, to give you an update on what our family is up to and what we've been doing. My wife and I uh, have celebrated our 23rd wedding anniversary this year. Uh, and as uh, Brother Andrew has already shared with you, we've all also celebrated our 15th year uh, at the Victory Baptist Church in Seagaville. Our oldest daughter is getting married in two weeks. Pray for us, if you would, uh, because uh, I don't know if I can afford it or if I'm going to be able to live through it, but nevertheless... Uh, we're going to try to endure it, uh, but uh, marrying a, a great, uh, good, godly young man who's in ministry. Uh, and then our middle daughter, Briley, is currently the drum major at Trinity Valley Community College uh, out in Athens, and she's getting married this next June. And so if anyone uh, has any money that they would like to donate to the cause, we're going to take up a love offering right after this. And if getting, two of them getting married wasn't enough, then I have a senior in high school, my youngest and only son, Brett Maverick. He'll be graduating this next May as well. So a lot of things going on at the Knowles house, uh, but uh, more blessings uh, than we can count. But as I said before, 
uh, we have a lot of things to be grateful for to this church. Uh, a lot of blessings that you gave and were a part of here uh, while we were here. And while we were here at Joshua, my girls were little. Brett wasn't born yet. Val was and still is gorgeous. Uh, my hairline was a lot thicker and my waistline thinner. It seems like a lifetime ago. But it doesn't matter how much time has passed or where God has taken us. We've never forgotten the people or the place that God used to draw us into ministry. And that place is this place. It's the Joshua Baptist Church. And so again, on behalf of me and my family, I want to say thank you. My family owe this church a great deal of gratitude. It was this church, like I said, that took us in, that allowed us to serve, that put a roof over our heads literally. And, I, I, and it was also here that I was licensed and ordained uh, to preach. And I pray that that license and ordination holds after this service. But to make a long story short, I'm thankful for the roots that God has given me here at the Joshua Baptist Church. You know, someone once said people without the knowledge and appreciation of their past, of their history, of the origin and culture, is like a tree without roots. And so tonight, if you would allow me to, my thought, my aim, I just want to challenge you just for a few minutes to remember your roots. Remember your roots. Tonight, four verses, four verses only, coming out of the book of Mark, Mark chapter 4, verses 26 through 29. Jesus is using one of his favorite backdrops. It's the Sea of Galilee, and he's already presented the parable of the sower. You know the parable. He's sharing it with a very diverse crowd, and this parable being a picture of the gospel and how it's rejected or received by a man's heart. The next few verses after that, he would steer to the parable of the candle again that explains uh, how, again, God uses men, women, giving them gifts and how he expects them to use those gifts for his honor and glory. But now here in verse 26, it's the passage of sowing and growing, the process of how God grows his kingdom. And we read, beginning in verse 26, the Bible says, and he said, that being Jesus, so is the kingdom of God, as if a man should cast seed into the ground and should sleep and rise night and day and the sea should spring up and grow up and he knoweth not how. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, and after that the full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he putteth in the sickle because the harvest is come. Friend, I want to talk to you again tonight, if I could, just about remembering our roots. Remembering our roots. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, as it's already been prayed, and I want to echo, thank you so much, uh, Father, for the gospel. Thank you, Father, for the gospel, the saving grace of the gospel, Lord, how it brings us the fact, the news that Jesus not only came to this earth, but he dwelt among us in flesh. And God, as he lived those 33 and a half sinless years, and God accomplished what no one else could accomplish on Calvary's tree, paying the sin debt for any and all who would call on his name. God, I thank you that the gospel, God, in your word, Father, has been communicated and communicated clearly. And God, I thank you that the gospel hasn't stopped being communicated. Father, it continues to echo in churches like this one, the Joshua Baptist Church. And Father, I want to thank you once again for the Joshua Baptist Church. I want to thank you for Dr. Wolfenbarger. I want to thank you for his wife, uh, Miss Wolfenbarger. I want to thank you for his family. I want to thank you for the staff. I want to thank you for the members who have stayed and served so faithfully all of these years. This is where my roots are, Father, and I thank you for it. And God, if you would allow me to, Lord, move me out of the way and allow me to communicate my gratitude while even more importantly pointing all of the appreciation, all of the glory to you. Because God, we need to remember where we came from. We need to remember our roots. So speak to us tonight, Lord, in words that I can't. And God, we'll give you all the praise and honor and glory. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. And all the church said, Amen. I'm going to get right into it because, brother... Andrew told me I got 25 minutes and how many of y'all were 
here when I was here and you were preaching, going through the seminary with me. Y'all remember that little orange light that would come? Uh, do y'all still have nightmares about that thing? Brother Andrew told me I was going to be preaching. I had 25 minutes, and I thought he was going to put an orange light up there to shut me up. So I'm going to move quickly. So I want to get into my first point, if I could, because tonight in remembering our roots, I pray that, first of all, you'll remember that a seed had to be sown. A seed had to be sown. Tonight I'm not here to give you a lesson on farming, but here in Mark chapter 4, Jesus is communicating his plan, his father's plan, the format, if you will, in the simplest of terms, how the kingdom of heaven would be grown. And it begins with the seed of his word. The seed of his word. And friend, let me tell you this. This is why there's no other word that will do it. You know, the world today will try to give you another word. They'll try to give you another way. They'll try to get you to compromise. They'll try to get you to change your focus. But friend, there is only one thing that matters in this world, and it is the word of God. We need to praise God that we have his word. Amen. Amen. And I commend you as a church for having a conference like this that focuses in on God's Word. It's God's Word that gives us power. It's God's Word that communicates salvation. It's God's Word that lets us know there is a Savior in the world today, and His name is Jesus Christ. And somebody better give me an amen there, amen? Oh, friend, this is the only Word that will do it. As a matter of fact, it's going to take a superior Word to get this seed moving where it needs to go, amen? A word that can, can only rise above the rest. Matter of fact, the psalmist wrote in Psalm 138, verse 2, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Friend, if God puts that type of emphasis on his word, I pray to God we do as well. Amen. Friend, this is a superior word, not just a superior word. I want you to think about this, this seed that God has given us in his word. It's a strong word, a strong word. This is the word that's going to last for eternity. I'll echo again the words of Isaiah, the Old Testament prophet in Isaiah 40, verse 8, where he said, The grass withereth and the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. And friend, I am so thankful that I have a word that doesn't come in and out, that it doesn't fade on and off the scene. It is the power of God's word that leads me, that guides me, that directs me towards him. And it's going to accomplish again what God set forth for it to do. It's going to guide us through the gates of heaven. Friend, this is a strong word. But it's not just superior. It's not just strong. It's also a saving word. This is the word that changes men's eternity. Oh, friend, I'm happy to tell you and echo again the fact that I know this word and not just in my head, I know it in my heart. Oh, I followed this word again to the result of my salvation. And if you're in here this this evening and you have followed the same word, you have confessed with your mouth the Lord Jesus and asked Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins, to come into your heart and be your Lord and Savior, friend, you too know what I'm talking about when it's a saving word. But friend, if you don't know this, I pray that you'll listen because Jesus said it's only this word that you'll be sanctified by. As a matter of fact, he said it in John 17, 17. He said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Well, friend, if you don't understand this, I'm going to warn you tonight, just like Jesus warned the Pharisees in Matthew 22, ye do err not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. Friends, as I encourage you to review and to remember your roots tonight, I pray you understand if you can't trace your roots back to the seed of God's word and the saving power of Jesus Christ that's communicated through its pages, then I pray you'll uproot your sins tonight and ask God to plant his word, his son, in the depths of your heart. You know, I appreciate, again, Brother Andrew was sharing with me the result of of yesterday's services, Dr. House, again, just teaching on God's word and, and the result being salvations and people coming and, and joining the church. And, and uh, it was ironic because as I was visiting with Brother Andrew on the phone, uh, our staff, we have a devotion every Monday morning, and it was this exact topic, the power of God's word that we were talking about. 
and how God's word, it doesn't matter. Again, the topic that you're preaching on, God ta- God's Holy Spirit takes that word and works it according to his will and reaches the heart, the heart right at its need. And yesterday, hearts were met with the need of salvation and salvation took place. See, this is the wonderment of God's word. This is why we need to thank God for his word. And friend, if it were not for the seed of his word being sown, me and you would be, oh, men most miserable. I am so thankful that this plan, God's plan, the plan that Jesus is echoing here, I'm so thankful that he pointed us back to the seed. And friend, I pray that you do as we reflect tonight, that we'll, as we remember our roots, we'll remember the seed that has to be sown. But something else I want you to consider tonight in remembering our roots, and that's a season has to be suffered. A season has to be suffered. I'll read it again in verse 26. And he said, So is the kingdom of God, as if a man should cast seed into the ground. And then listen closely. He said, And it should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should spring up and grow up. And he knoweth not how, for the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, and after that the full corner in the ear. Jesus is telling, telling us that somewhere between sleep and rise there's some work going on there's some work going on and now again this seed that's been planted is starting to shoot it's starting to push its way through the soil and it's a difficult push it's work sometimes it's even painful and as it goes through the different phases of growth it it endures seasons of suffering he gives illustration. First it's the blade, then it's the ear, and then finally it results in the, in the fruit that it was purposed to be. It's a long, difficult journey. But nevertheless, the fruit is produced. And Frank, can I say that? Say this, that that is exactly, it's a perfect picture of the life of a Christian. Oh, as the word of God is planted in our hearts and as it starts to work in us and it starts to produce again a fruit, a production of what God would have us to be, we go through these growing pains and sometimes it hurts, doesn't it? Oh, it's not just the growing pains that hurts, it's the persecution that comes by proclaiming yourself as a child of God, as an ambassador of heaven. Persecution sets in and and friend, this shouldn't be anything of a surprise. Oh, we've been given warning in 2 Timothy 3, 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ, Jesus shall suffer persecution. Oh, let's be honest. Sometimes it gets hard, doesn't it? Sometimes it gets difficult. Sometimes living for the Lord, there is suffering involved. But friend, understand this. If you're doing it right, you will experience a season of suffering. The greatest illustration I can give of this, as a matter of fact, I'm studying on this message what to say, what to share with you tonight, how to say thank you, but to do it in the right way in this particular point. My mind went straight to a family that we have over at the Victory Baptist Church in Seagaville. This family, a wonderful family, all of them involved in ministry, but it wasn't always that way. It's about seven years ago I received a phone call. It was about 10 o'clock at night and it was a lady by the name of Sherry Culver. She was the grandmother of the family. Faithful woman, faithful to church, good godly woman, praying woman, serving woman, a wonderful example to an entire family. And her grandson that she was raising on behalf of her drug addict daughter had just gotten into a motorcycle accident. First time on a motorcycle, he runs head first into a brick mailbox. They rushed him to an emergency room over in Baylor Medical Center over in Dallas. And we go up there, and by the time we got up there, there was a whole waiting room full of people. And if you've ever experienced anything like that, you know that those scenes are traumatic, to say the least. But as the news is coming out of the operating room, as they're telling us Cody's condition You know, it's not getting any better. As a matter of fact, the mother comes in and she's barely coherent and she's dropping to her knees and she's crying and she's asking God, God, why are you allowing this to happen to my baby? The doctor pulls me aside, asks me if I'm the preacher. I said, yes, sir. He pulls me back into the room. He said, the family is wanting to go back and see Cody and I want to suggest that they don't. 
His face is almost unrecognizable. The damage is too far gone. We're getting ready to pull the plug. You may want to go tell the family. I walk out into a waiting room of about 80 to 90 people. All eyes faced on me. What to say? I didn't have a clue. All I said was, is get ready. God's about to do something. We need to pray for the family. We need to pray for what's about to happen because there's about to be a season of suffering. Oh, friend, at that time, we didn't understand it. At that time, I couldn't comprehend it. At that time, I thought, God, what in the world is going on? Oh, it was that time between sowing and the morning. Somewhere in between that sleep and rise, somewhere in between all that. And I don't know how it happened, just like we don't know how this grows, how again that seed as it's planted, how God works it and how he produces the fruit, how he grows it and matures it. We don't understand it. I didn't understand what was taking place in this situation, but what God produced out of that one instant, oh friend, I wouldn't trade it for the world. Miss Sherry, the grandmother who had prayed for over 40 years, for her lost husband. Through that one instance, through that time of suffering, I was able to sit down at those people's dining room table and lead that old man to the Lord. Amen. Oh, it was through that that Cody's aunt and uncle who had been in and out of church, who had been off and on at times, who hadn't been faithful, all of a sudden God uses that instance, that time of suffering, to grab their heart, to draw them back into a faithful walk with him. Now where are they? They're at church every Sunday. Now where are they? They're knocking doors every Saturday. Now where are they? They're teaching Sunday school classes. As a matter of fact, both of those men are now my deacons. Please pray for me. Oh, friend, I want you to understand something as we reflect. As you're reflecting with me tonight, if you're remembering your roots, if your roots began with the word of God in your life, you'll be able to look back. You'll be able to see seasons of suffering, but you won't look back with regret. You know, we talk about Cody frequently. As a matter of fact, Brother Mike Culver, the uncle, he teaches one of our Bible study groups and he talks about how God used that instant. He said, you know, I never want to walk through that darkness again. I never want to get to the point where God has to get my attention by making me go through a season of suffering like that. I don't want to have to go through, again, God getting my attention like that ever again. I want to stay faithful. If he chooses to lead me through a season of suffering, I pray it's something else, but not that. Nevertheless, he says, you know what, though? I wouldn't trade that experience for the world because I got to see a face of God's grace like I've never got to see. Oh, you've got to know the seed. You've got to know God. You've got to know his word, if you can say something like that, about going through a season of suffering. Oh, friend, as I reflect, as we look back, as we remember our roots, as we remember where we came from, as we remember where it all started, friend, I pray you remember again. It started with the seed. I pray you remember again that there is going to be a season of suffering, but it's going to be all right because my third and final point before Dr. House comes up, remember a Savior has to be celebrated. A Savior has to be celebrated. Oh, look at it again quickly, verse twenty. Eight, he says, for the earth bringeth forth the fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, and after that full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he putteth in the sickle, because the harvest is come. Because the harvest is come. Oh, the reward of the work, the reward of the planting of the seed, the reward of the suffering in the season. Now again, there is a bountiful harvest that one day will be reaped. You know, I look across here, I see some familiar faces, and faces that we worked side by side, hand in hand, uh, sweated together. Some of us bled together, uh, literally bled together. If you worked in youth, we bled together. And it amazes me to see, again, those, those same faces that, grew up in the youth department serving the Lord. I commend you on that. And I would love to take credit for it, but I'm not smart enough. I would love to take credit for it, but I'd, I'm not powerful enough. Oh, it's because those young men and women did the same thing that Jesus is communicating here. They have roots that go back to the seed of God's word. They have endured the seasons of suffering. They have stayed faithful to the Lord. And now those ministries that they're involved in, those ministries that they're investing in, they're going to see a harvest 
that one day Jesus is going to reign. I'll close with this. Whenever I first became pastor of the Victory Baptist Church, the founding pastor, Brother Odie Grammer was still there. And it wasn't until I got around Brother Odie that I became thankful for my pastor. Because I realized the love it takes to start a church and then to keep it going. The sacrifice that it takes and oh, whenever I got there, it, the church had gone through a, a terrible, terrible incident. I don't have time to go into it. Just say, again, it was just a horrible situation. And, and so whenever I got there, Brother Odie was there and uh, again, they weren't necessarily treating him with the love and respect that they should have. And, and so he approached me after about two months of me being there. And he said, Brother Chris, if me being here is going to hinder your ministry, I'll leave. I told him, Brother Odie, if you leave, I'm going with you because, bless God, I need the help. Amen. <laughs> well, we became close friends, and I mean close friends. I would go over to his house on a weekly basis just to check in on him. I'd go over there all frustrated and tell him what's going on. He'd start laughing at me, give me some wisdom, and send me on my way. There's something he would say every time I'd leave. He said, you know, one day, one day, we're going to see the blessings of all this. One day, we're going to see God finally get the glory for all of this. One day, we're going to get to be a part of a celebration of giving God thanks for everything he's allowed us to see. Pray if you don't hear anything. If you don't hear anything else that I say, I pray that you'll hear this. What's taking place here at Joshua Baptist Church, unfortunately in today's time and age, is very unique. God has given you a great church. God has given you a great pastor. And it started a long time ago, a lot longer than Dr. Wolfenbarger surrendered his life to the Lord, friend. It goes back all the way prior to the creation of all that we see and foresee. God's word came from his heart, communicating his love. And because that love has been communicated down through the ages and then here at the Joshua Baptist Church for some 30 plus years, friend, I cannot wait to get before the Lord and see again the harvest that this church has produced for God. I want to encourage you if I could. Oh, remember your roots. Remember your roots. Thank God. Thank God that you have a seed that you can go back to, trace your success, your life, your heart back to. It's God's word. That's the power that's in it. If you're in that season of suffering, endure it. It's only for the night. The Bible says joy cometh in the morning. And when that morning comes, friends, oh, there's not going to be anything like it.